uh, actually want to hear this man. Um, if there's ever been a preacher whom God has raised up for such a time as this, it is our speaker tonight. He is highly anointed. God has given him a word and I appreciate um, Dr. Stone as he referred to me as a warrior for the unborn. Well, I tell you, this man is a warrior for the unborn. He's known from America to Africa for fighting for unborn babies. He preached the Bible, the biblical standard, and he has, there is an anointing on him that is an unusual one. Uh, I've been told, and every time I'm told this, it is a complete honor that our ministries and our scope and our uh, preaching uh, is similar. And I, I, you know, there are some people that you want to be identified with. This man of God, I want to be identified with. He is over our global missions and he's doing a tremendous job. And um, the work, amen, the work that he is doing uh, in Memphis and around the country uh, is amazing. And as a matter of fact, one of our finest members, oh my sister Leslie, where's Leslie tonight? There she is. Uh, she was a member of this church and uh, uh, through her work, she met Bishop, uh, our guest, and, um, and he called upon her to come out to Memphis and to be a part of the work. We have a, a tremendous orphanage out there. And we are, we, are, we are taking care of babies. We're getting homeless people off the street. One of the wonderful things, uh, one of the bad things about the Church of God in Christ is that we do not do a good job telling our own story. Oftentimes we allow naysayers and uh, people, little clips online to identify us and to plug us and people look at some things that are crazy and say that's what the church of God and Christ is all about. Well, that's not what the church is all about. Our church is doing great things. Um, because of Bishop Matthew, Sister Leslie, Monet, and, and those workers out there, that children who were in orphanages sleeping on floors with no beds and no places to go, they are all now in, in, uh, in beds and in a secure environment. Amen. I have personally uh, worked with the team to go and meet with the, the governor of Tennessee and to ch t share with the governor of Tennessee what this man of God is doing, what our great church is doing. And we're, the, the governor of Tennessee has been tremendously impressed by the work of the Church of God in Christ. And we're looking at a tremendous partnership uh, as they sow into what we are doing. We didn't go to them without begging, saying we have a vision. We went to them saying, this is what we're doing. And these are the millions of dollars that we've invested. And this is the beautiful orphanage. And this is the work that's uh, being completed and the work that has, that has been done. And this is what's actually going on. And it's under the leadership, of course, of our presiding bishop. But this is his point man. And he is a tremendous, tremendous man of God. I'm proud of him. I'm proud of him. I'm proud of what he represents for our church. And you know, uh, I think that we've just got to do a better job telling the story of the church of God in Christ. We're doing things that no other church has ever done. Me and this man of God uh, and Elder John Amanchuku worked late into the night. John was in the meeting and we worked late into the night to help forge the church of God in Christ pro-life statement. We were among the ones. And, and when it was over, we had to walk gingerly because ice was everywhere. And we, we slid our way into the vehicle to get back to the hotel and we were all riding together and we knew that night that something special had taken place. And do you not know that the only church 
in existence today that has an actual pro-life statement as a part of that church is the church of God in Christ. And this man was one of the major forces behind it. Amen. Our friends online, give us some hand claps. Praise the Lord and some hearts. See, see, we, uh, listen, I'm determined that we're not going to be defined by the foolishness. That's right. Amen. I'm determined that people are not going to look at mishaps and say, oh, that's what Kojic is all about. No, this is what Kojic is all about. Someone said to me one time, said, your church isn't the typical church of God in Christ. You're different. You're, you're not like the church of God in Christ. I said, yes, we are. We are like the church of God in Christ. I'm in the church of God in Christ. I got saved through the church of God in Christ. Preacher, my credentials are cogent. Amen. I'm a church of God in Christ. Bishop, I've been consecrated in the church. I got my authority from the church. How dare you say I'm not like the church of God in Christ? Yes, I am. I'm just not like some of the others that are in the church. And in all denominations, there are those that do some shortcomings and whatnot, but you can't define us by the worst of us. You got to define us by the best of us. And tonight we have one of the best. I was in the West Wing of the White House and I'll never forget while in there, uh, my wife and I were in there, we were talking and we saw all of the, all of the big wheels and all of the power brokers and, and all of a sudden people started to moving and getting in a hurry and I'm, I'm trying to figure out, well, what's going on now? Bishop Matthews had walked into the room and when he walked in, they all rushed to him and was thanking him and appreciating him for the work that he does. Bishop Vincent E. Matthews Jr. is happily married to one wife, Sharon Denise Matthews, and they reside in Mississippi. God has blessed him with 11 children, eight boys and three girls. Applause go in there. He serves as president of the Church of God in Christ World Missions. And that's not an empty title. He has the responsibility of over, to oversee humanitarian work, disaster relief, and church planting in almost 100 countries worldwide. And he's being very successful in that. I think a round of applause go in there. Amen. Bishop Matthews graduated from Wayne State University uh, and also with a BA and also the University of Illinois with MA and North Carolina College of Theology. We share that, uh, that experience and that alma mater and he has a doctorate of theology from there. He was a Fulbright Fellow while studying African language, Swahili, at the university, I hope I get this right, Da Es Shalom. Is that close enough? <laughs> In Tanzania. While Matthews has won numerous awards, he declares that his primary goal in life is to hear God say, Well done, thy good and faithful servant. The first time I heard this man of God preach, uh, we were in Memphis, Tennessee, and I think it was either on a Friday, no, it was on a Saturday, and um, uh, in the auditorium, remember that? And as he fought for the life of the unborn and preached conviction in the hearts of the people, I said, God, I thank you for that man of God. I was greatly inspired. And our friends who are watching tonight, I want you to uh, get on the phone, share this, uh, call someone and tell them that Bishop Matthews is about to preach. You want to hear what this man of God has to say. And I think we will all walk away blessed as a result. 
and there are so many others that I could give accolades and respect to. But I want to, I want to, I want to, the, the, the bulk of the time to go to hearing from this man of God tonight. Receive ye him. Let's say a word of prayer. Father, we trust you. We trust you in these challenging times in which we face. We thank you that you've allowed us to be alive in this era. And Father, I thank you for this great jurisdiction. I thank you for this great bishop and first lady and these great leaders of this jurisdiction. I thank you for this great cloud of saints of witnesses that are in this place. But I recognize, God, that I'm not smart enough, I'm not articulate enough, I'm not good enough, I'm not powerful enough to speak to these people. I'm by far not even the best preacher in this room. I'm not qualified to stand here. And so at this point, I then, realizing this, ask that from this point forward, that I not say another word, and that you speak a rhema prophetic word through me. I ask that at this point, most of the people in this room, I don't know. I don't know where they're from, where they've been, what's going on in their lives. But if you will speak to us, we will be strengthened. So speak to us tonight, oh God. Speak to our hearts in the name of Jesus. Lord, we rebuke every demonic force that comes to hinder your word. Satan, the Lord, rebuke you even right now. Rebuke every distracting spirit, every hindering spirit, every confusing spirit, every competitive spirit is rebuked. You are defeated even right now in the name of Jesus. And we claim that somebody will be saved tonight. Somebody will be filled and refilled with your Holy Ghost tonight. Somebody will be reclaimed on tonight. Somebody will be healed in their body. They don't have to wait to the altar call that even as you speak, there will be transformation in our lives. Somebody will be reconciled in the name of Jesus. We bless you and we praise you and we give you glory, praise and honor. And we bless you even right now, oh God. And we thank you in Jesus name we pray. Hallelujah. And the people of God that agree with that prayer, just shout amen. Shout amen. You can do whatever you want to do. If you want to stand up, stand up. If you want to sit down, sit down. You in your father's house. I don't know what to tell you what to do. Just do whatever God tell you to do. I'm so grateful to be here on today. I am deeply honored and humbled to be at the, the famous upper room with the famous North Carolina third jurisdiction with a great man of God who he is indeed a warrior and we've been in fights together, he's correct. And um, I honor you, Bishop. I thank God for you, Bishop. I really honor your Bishop and his wife. I honor you, Mother. And um, no, 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 I'm talking about your Bishop, Bishop Wooden, man, this dude. He the real deal. I mean, seriously. And um, I just thank God because there is a remnant and um, I recognize I don't I never get discouraged when you see these uh, I can't think of a more articulate word than jokers I can't you see these <laughs> I was looking for one in my mental thesaurus I couldn't find one when you see these folks because he's right we will not be defined by the worst of us will be defined by great men of God like this man of God, Bishop Wooden. <clears throat> I honor you and I thank God, Bishop Wooden, I'm honored by the invitation and I'm honored to be here on this AIM convention night. And thank God for the chairman of the AIM convention. We honor you and thank God for this great convention and all the auxiliary leaders. My wife Sharon sends her greetings to you. She sends her love to you. I love her. She might be watching right now. Hey, and um, I thank God for my wife Sharon. God has blessed us to be together. We're married, happily married. And um, the beautiful thing about our children is that um, I was about 13 or 14. And I wasn't even saved. Got an injury playing football, had surgery, and they told me I would never have children. And I prayed and said, Lord, I got to have children one day. I want to at least have some boys. And so when God started blessing us, when I, when I married, I said, I don't think I can have children. And when God started blessing us with children, I would not cut off what God opened up. And I said, thank you, Jesus. God has provided for us. 
and he's provided for us. You know, I got children. I got, I have three children in college right now. I don't pay a dime. I don't pay nothing. I have three children in college. Who said children are expensive? God got everything. I got three children in college now, all in top universities. Then paid. I haven't paid for anybody. All of our children, and we pulled them out of. We pulled them out of the mouth, the mouth of the beast, um, the schools, and we homeschooled. And people said we messed up, but then they found out. It's just an expectation in our house. We're gonna take the ACT. Then those people gonna call us and give us money to go to school, and that's what we do. And I thank God for His provision and his grace and so our children are upgrade and if I could I'd have 11 more but I got a quote on their head I want 30 grandchildren amen so I have we have three now and I'm honored to be here and he mentioned evangelist Monet she's there with us um, helping us we have a a, a a new church that we planted in in 2020 during COVID in April 2020 we started a church we started in-person service in May 2020 and so it's a brand new church and she's helping us as we are planting that church and I need you to know she represents you all well there in Mississippi. We're in Mississippi but Memphis area and we honor her and we thank God for her being a part. I, I want to thank God for your supervisor Supervisor Dijonet we honor you Supervisor Dijonet and we thank God for you. We thank God for uh, Sister Wilburn who works with us um, and she's about to got, your, got all your packet Bishop we're going to ship her out to East Africa, I think. That's what I saw. Or not ship her out, but she's going to be helping in East Africa. I'm sorry. That's how it's her face. She's going to be helping in East Africa. And we thank God for her. I saw my brother. I'm originally from Detroit. Um, and lived in South Africa for 12 years, came to Mississippi. I'm originally from Detroit and saw my brother, a great mentor to many, uh, Superintendent Therrington. I thank God for that man of God. It was great to see him from Detroit. And I honor your missions president, mission president Shonda Murray. We thank God for you, missions president. So, so I believe I have an assignment here today and I want to get to the word of God and I believe the assignment first of all I'm in North Carolina third jurisdiction which means that it's kind of like uh, if you were to grade it academically, I'm at a postgraduate class with a bunch of postgraduates. You already got doctorate degrees and all this other kind of thing. It was a postgraduate, so I'm not here to teach you anything. I'm just here to remind you of what you already know. Uh, I don't make the assumption that everybody here is saved because I believe you all are so high level that you would not drive with an empty car. You would bring somebody to church, your children, your grandchildren, to unsaved, your neighbor. So I assume that there's somebody here that needs to know God, but I believe that God has a here on assignment, a gathering of the remnant, even with your theme, standing strong on biblical standards, emphasis on standing strong and biblical standards. I think they both hinge together that there are some people who are standing strong in the fight and the opposition that we have. It's almost impossible to keep up with all that is happening around us on a daily basis. It's a swirl, but only the best way we can look at it is that there's spiritual wickedness in this time. And there's signs of the times. We're at the end of times. And then um, the signs of the times are we're in the times of the signs. And we're definitely in biblical uh, proportions and biblical times. And I thank God for the AV team that has my PowerPoint. And you can put it up now. And I believe my, my goal is, is not necessarily to define the times because I believe in this postgraduate class called North Carolina Third Jurisdiction AIM Convention. You understand the, the, what is happening around us. But, uh, but also to recognize and understand that not only what is happening, what the, the, the problem, but understanding the solution and understanding what is that standard and how that standard applies. And then finally, there's a demonic spirit of, of discouragement and frustration that comes to attack the saints of God. And I believe my final assignment is to encourage you in this message that you will be encouraged, that the enemy seeks to discourage and to frustrate the people of God and wonder what, what's the use. But I'm here to tell you that it's worth it. And so I want to share with you just straight from your text. It challenged me standing strong on biblical standards, standing strong on biblical standards. Um, and the scripture blessed me. Isaiah 62, 10 through 12, Psalms 27. We know that by memory. But this scripture blessed me. If you allow me to read it, I will go through. 
We can stop there. We can stop right there. Go through. Go through the gates. Prepare the way for the people. So which means it's not just all about us. We're paving the way. Build up. Build up the highway. Take out the stones. I'm reading from the New King James Version. Lift up a banner for the peoples. Indeed, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the world, say to the daughter of Zion, surely your salvation is coming. Behold, his reward is with him. Hold on. Note on reward. Note on reward. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. And they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And you shall be called sought out. A city not forsaken. Now, while I'm tempted to exegete this text, I won't. But I I believe this sets the tone for where we are because it really sets the tone for where the problem is now. If we're called in this time to go forth and to pave the way for the people, prepare the way, it means they're not following the way. To build up, it means there's some things that have been torn down. To build up a highway means there's no way. To take up stones, to clear path, lift up the banner. The banner has been brought down. Our Jehovah Nisi is not lifted and then to stand and prepare the way and to recognize that there's rewards coming we don't talk about that enough so I, it's here in the text and I, I just want you to understand that and so I want to really look at the problem what is the problem why is this not happening and I saw a study and this study was uh, by George Barna and uh, the Arizona Christian University just last year and the problem the real problem is that There are too few standard bearers. There are too few people holding up the standard. There are too too few people that are going through. Now, I'm not going to stay long on this study because you probably already read it. It came out last year. First of all, I heard the the, 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 the inspirational preacher. There he is. We together, my brother. We together. And he mentioned twice biblical worldview. So that's what we're talking about. And then he went to Acts 4. You'll see that's in the text. I didn't put that in here. They had it. So I know the Holy Ghost is speaking. So first thing we got to start with is there are too few standard holders that share a biblical worldview. Right. Our worldview has been tainted. There's a whole lot of people that's real black, but not Christian. Right. You still doing Kwanzaa, pouring into your dead granny, but don't don't look to Jesus. But that's a whole nother thing for another minute. We'll get there. So 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 to understand that, first we gotta all make sure we're together. The seven cornerstones of a biblical worldview. First of all, how we see God, how you view God. Right. And and to be biblical in how we view God, we view God as eternal. We view God as omniscient. He knows everything. Omnipotent. He's all powerful. He's just. He's the creator of everything. And he's engaged with us. He's not just off somewhere, but he's a personal God. That's a biblical view on God. A biblical view on humans. You know, we live in a day where people don't, humans don't like humans. They, They love dogs and hate humans. Yeah, they adopt dogs and leave human children in foster care. We live in a time where people will buy health insurance for a dog and won't take care of their own niece, their nephew. But that's, that's, uh, yeah, that's another thing for, let me, let me stay focused. So humans, humans are not naturally good. That humans are ugly, nasty, and sinful. With degrees, with designer clothes, with with nice houses, but humans are jacked up. That's biblical. We all need to be saved. There are no good sinners. That's biblical. Now, we make the assumption there's good people, you know, Jeffrey Dahmer, which I don't know who would have watched his biopic or whatever that was and entered, let the demons come into your house after watching that and wonder why you can't sleep and why you can't get nothing right. You got curses all over your life because you was watching that mess. But yeah, um, we all need to be saved from the consequences of sin in our life. That's a biblical worldview. We also believe Jesus Christ is our only means of being saved. Not, 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 your, not aligning your chakras with the universe. Not doing yoga. 
No, the only way you can be free is through okay, Yeshua Hamashiach. You can say it in you can say it in Hebrew. You can say Jesus. You can say the Savior. But I don't, it don't matter how you say it. But you better call on Jesus. The only way to God. I don't care what Oprah said. There's only one way to God. And the only way you can be saved is by confessing sin. Yeah. Repent. You can't just turn over a new leaf. Got him now, just be nice. Repent and embrace him as my savior. Biblical worldview says, I can't stay on these things because y'all, y'all kind of, y'all about to mess me up. A biblical worldview believes that the Bible is true. If you disagree with the Bible, the Bible's not wrong, you're wrong. If you disagree, if you can't fit, I got a lot of question marks in my Bible. When I read, I was like, I don't understand this. This don't make sense. But I found out it wasn't the Bible that was wrong because I was out of alignment. And, and it was no counsel. There was no counsel. I know everybody want to call a counsel and I see and all this other stuff. There was no counsel that wrote your Bible for you. King James didn't write your Bible. No more than John F. Kennedy knew anything about flying an airplane. They got a whole airport named after him in New York. King James Bible, don't matter. Oh, they, they changed the Bible and Constantine. No, no, no. The Bible was already, the canon was discovered long before there was ever a council. And it ain't changed either. And, and oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Bible is true. The Bible is reliable. The Bible is relevant, and the Bible is, I got best, it's the only moral guy. Our morality comes from the unchanging word of God. We believe that, it, uh, yeah, okay. We believe also, oh, by the way, oh, somebody said the Bible was the white man's book to hold us down. Like, man, you ain't even read the Bible. If you had read the Bible, you would see that uh, you really, the, 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 the Bible, first of all, is people of color until you get to the white folks that were Europeans, they were the bad guys. <laughs> the Europeans were the bad guys. The rest of these folks were folks of color from all around the world. What you talking about? Man, you done ate a bean pie, went to jail for 10 minutes and came out confused. Read the Bible for yourself. If you are a Christian, we believe that absolute mor uh, moral truth exists. We believe that truth is absolute. So, which means there's no such, no such thing as my truth and your truth. Tell your truth, your truth. No, there's no your truth, my truth. If that's the case, no, I believe what I believe. Go to the bank today and tell them uh, how much I got in my bank. And they tell you got $20. And you say, that's true to you, but not to me. I got a million dollars. And see if you don't get escorted up out the bank. Truth is true. No matter what you believe. You don't have to, I know kids these days don't believe in that. You don't have to believe in gravity. Jump off the building and find out if it's true. What goes up comes down. Truth is absolute. I had a professor that told me truth is not absolute. There are other truths. And I said, do you believe that absolutely? Somebody tell you there is no truth. Ask them, is it true? Because if you say there's no truth, it's a self-defeating statement in and of itself. We also believe that success, 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 success is not about your 100% human hair you bought, brothers. Uh, success, true success. Oh, what y'all, what, what, what I say? Men buy wigs more than women these days. That brother with dreads, that ain't, he didn't, he, he didn't grow them dreads. Success, I like it here. Success is consistent, not with your bank account, not with the type of clothes you wear, 
Success is not about the job that you have. So many people have sold themselves out to somebody else's vision and have no vision from God. True success is consistent with obedience to God. You want to know who's successful? Oh, I know a lot of people drive nice cars and they're losers. I know a lot of people wear nice clothes. You can have the latest Jordans. You can have the latest whatever. You're still a loser. But I know some folks don't have all that, but they, but they lined up with God. And they, they dared to say yes, and they got some stuff that money can't buy. Anybody here don't have a lot of money, but you got some peace. Anybody got some joy? Anybody got strength? When you feel like you can't go on, you can move on. True success is be lying with God. Anybody, I'm not smart. I'm not smart. I definitely know I ain't smart. I'm not smart, but I'll tell you what. Oh, yeah, that was kind of cool. I'm not smart, but I'll tell you what. I, 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 I call it kind of walking in minefields. I just follow what God say the next step. And sometimes I look crazy because I'm walking like this. But you know what? The bottom line, he know where all the minds at. So stuff don't blow up on me like it blew up on you. Tell somebody, I'm successful because I trust God. And then finally, you want to confuse saints. You can confuse pastors, bishops, you can confuse supervisors, district missionaries, ask them what their purpose in life is. They start giving you some Dr. Phil kind of stuff. Uh, you know my purpose is just my, my purpose. Our purpose is to know, love, and serve God. That's our purpose. With all our heart, our mind, strength, and soul. This is my purpose. This is why I'm here. I know love and serve God. I know love and serve God by serving my wife. I know love and serve God by serving my family. I know love and serve God by, by, by fulfilling the great commission. This, my brothers and sisters, is a biblical worldview. And there are so many Christians that don't believe half this. And, they say things like, you know, believe in yourself. Like, believe in yourself? There's no good thing in this flesh. No wonder you so discouraged. Now, I can't, I gotta move because this like introduction. So, I can't preach the introduction. <laughs> then you're gonna call me long-winded it. The source of our worldview influences vary by age. This has been a study. All of us get our worldview from arts and entertainment. That's why you better watch. One of the most demonic things you can do is sleep with the TV on all night. You sleep with the TV on, you just letting them demons in and out of your house. You waking up buying nonstick skillets. You know you cook with grease. Why are you buying nonstick skillets? Because they've been talking it all night. You just, I just think I need this nonstick skillet. You're dropping it like it's hot, fussing and cussing. And arts and entertainment, the enemy knows that. And so he shapes our worldview through the internet and social media, through the first wave of artificial intelligence, which the artificial intelligence is training us on how to do like Pavlov's dog, conditioning us worse than a slave was ever conditioned. But oh, you know you condition that when you wake up, you don't say hi to your spouse, you don't talk to your children, you check your notifications. You know you jacked up. Your brain is being rewired to change what you like. Oh, no, I know that's right. Your sensors of pleasure comes through likes and, and, and loves and comments. That's why you mad that I looked at your picture and didn't say nothing. You called me a troll. I said, you put your business out there. I don't have to say nothing. So they rewired your sensors of pleasure. Oh. Go ahead, post a selfie right now. Every, every three minutes, you checking to see how many people like. Because you're looking for approval from folks you don't even know. You're looking at comments from bots. Bots been commenting on your stuff, and you would do anything to get more. So you do it. Take selfie. Now you take selfie. Now the selfie got to... <sighs> Adults get their worldview from news, and they all lying on the news. They lying, they be lying. I was here, I watched the PBS News Hour. They lied the whole time. They talk nice and soft, but they lying. NPR lying. 
Fox lying, MSNBC lying, CNN show enough lying. <laughs> it knew, and they know that if they put it on the news, there's a certain population, piece of the population that believed because it was on the news. It was on the news, it got to be true. <laughs> Our children and teens get their worldview from their family. Our peers and children and teens get their worldview from their peers and friends. We get our worldview from our affinity groups, who you hanging out with. Public policy and laws. This is why we fight to overturn or to stop and block laws. Because when something has been made a law, it has now been made legitimate to the population. It's just a law and a school. And then our teens listen to celebrities and athletes. But you know what's interesting? I'm not saying this. This is coming straight from the study. Most pastors of Christian churches lack a biblical worldview. According to this study, pastors without a biblical worldview, 63% of pastors do not have a biblical worldview. They preach and all they talk about is coming out. All they talking about, you coming out. Your day of harvest is coming. Harvest what, man? You can get a bad harvest. What you talking about? That's right. Yep. Good preacher, Good they won't touch nothing real. Nothing. I can stay there, but I can't. Most parents of young children, it's worse with parents. Most parents with children under the age of 8, 13, 98% of parents with children under 13 do not have a Christian worldview. So if Timmy come up and get saved today, that's nice. He got saved, but he on the honor roll. He got all A's and we'll tell everybody. Even if he got all A's in doctrines of demons. We happy. We so happy. My child going to Harvard, that wicked ex-Christian school that got flipped. Why are you so happy you went to Harvard? You went to Yale. I feel I met a preacher came to me. I want to work with you. You know, I've been to Yale. I said, I'm so sorry. Are you saved? I'm so sorry. Who told you to go to Yale? <laughs> and see somebody hating right now. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> we judge. We allow our children by the standards of the world. Where your child at now? At home getting turned out on Snapchat and TikTok? Where your grandchildren now? This, I know I'm telling you, where your grandchild at? Now, how you here and left your child at home? That's abuse. That's abuse. You don't know what pedophile online, and they call it a minor attracted person. According to the World Wall Street Journal yesterday, they said Instagram is helping them to turn out the children. They said this yesterday, and ain't no investigation on that. Where your child at? Well, I don't want to take, you know, politics in the church. Politics in the church? Well, we here having church. I ain't no politics. So child in trouble because the parent don't really believe in God. The majority of parents do not believe that there's absolute moral truth. They do not believe that the Bible is God's truth, reliable words. They do not believe Jesus is the only means of being saved. They don't believe that success is consistent to obedience with God. They're not teaching that to their children. They do not believe the purpose of life is to be fully know, love, and serve God. They don't believe that God is the basis of truth, and they definitely don't believe God is omnipotent, omniscient, just, perfect, perfect creator. They don't believe it. The average parent spends more time trying to make sure that their child fits in. Make sure their child doing what the other kids down the street doing. They happy that their child on the football team. Yeah, if he can score a touchdown, he doing something. If she can be a cheerleader, stand up in front of all them men with her skirt up to here. Hey, 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 hey. And they all got their phones with your child. You glad your child on the, the cheerleading team. You glad your son pledged and he now a Q, he now a Kappa, he now an Alpha. That's jacked up. Oh, 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 before you, before you get mad, I pledge, I pledge for real, for real. I mean, they beat me till my behind was as hard as this. I count that as dung. 
Oh, no, I'm hard, hard, hard. I play it for real. That, that mess, I don't tell much. You don't, you don't need to be validated by nobody to whoop your behind so you can put on some colors so your mama can be proud that you can ski away and be an AKA. The devil is a lie. My validation, I want my children to be saved. I want my children to be sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, running in ministry, and I'll be the proudest daddy ever. Hallelujah. I'm still learning the, the terrain. <laughs> what you proud of of your children? Isn't this something that the church can give our children scholarships to go to college? Within the first semester, they don't come back to us. They hate us. We gave them money and they hate us. Because they never cared about what you cared about. They took your money, they got your stuff, and they hate your God, and they going to hell. So you raise your child with everything but God, and now you going to heaven, and they going to hell, because you didn't tell them about a burning hell and a heaven. Your child going to hell. That, that, that's worse than detention. That's worse than not getting in college. My child, I can't, I can't stand to be in heaven and my child going to hell because I didn't teach them. I didn't train them up. Hell is real. So the solution, I don't want to just talk about the problem. I just want to get through this. The solution is true standard bearers. And that the text to be standard bearers. Any standard bearers in here? If you a standard bearer, say something. And if you not, say help me to be a standard bearer, Lord. It don't matter how old you are, Lord, the sunshine band section over here. It don't matter how old you are, you can be a standard bearer. And if mama is Jack, daddy Jack, you don't have to follow them. You can be free for yourself. You make a decision. I'm not going to follow the dysfunction that has come before me. I'm going to be free. We just celebrated Juneteenth on Monday. There were slaves who was praying for freedom, who should have been free. Some of them died, slaves, thinking God didn't answer their prayers. There's some folks in here wondering why God didn't answer their prayers. You, been, you should have been free. As I don't know. I don't know. Y'all famous preachers. I don't know them. I don't know. I don't know them people that do whole Grammy award things on they on they pulpit demons and stuff like that. I don't even know that mess. I don't even know how you do that. I, all I know, I, 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 I'm trying to read the Bible from Genesis to the end. And when I get finished, I want to read it some more because I need to know him. If you save, you've been saved more than six months. You ain't read the whole Bible. You playing. You playing. I don't even want to hear you preach. How you preaching? You ain't read the whole Bible. How you going to be a missionary? You can't miss if you ain't read the Bible. Read the whole Bible for yourself. Quit quoting cliches and quit saying what the old people used to say. Quit saying what they used to say back in the day. Just because they old don't mean they couldn't have been wrong. You need to know what God is saying. How you gonna be saved and not read the Bible? You done read everything else, reading big thick romance novels. Done read all them books to get your degree. You took that seriously, but now you don't read the Bible because you can slide. I grew up in the church. You no, you didn't grow up in the church. You grew up around the church. You ain't in the church till you born again. So, so, so what had happened was for real. Let's let's get back to the text. The solution, somebody say the solution. the solution. The solution is true standard bearers. I don't care when you were born. They want to sociologically define us. Oh, you, you're a Gen Z. You, you're a millennial. You know how we millennials are. No, I don't know. You know I'm a Gen, what am I, Gen X, whatever, right? Yeah, whatever. And that, that boomer over there and that silent generation over there. Now, now, forget about that. Forget about that. Because the people of God transcend the times. The people of God transcend the culture. And the saints are the saints no matter how old you are. No 
matter how old you are, you know, we, we, so, so you read your Bible on the phone and I read my Bible with paper, but you better be living the same thing. The true solution is to be true standard bearers. I want to just show you something real quick. We got to know the grand biblical narrative. The grand biblical narrative. Hallelujah. The grand biblical narrative is four things. Creation, fall, redemption, consummation. That there, my brothers, is the gospel. And I make sure I rotate through that. When I'm preaching at my church, my folks are going to hear creation, fall, redemption, consummation. That's the biblical narrative right there. What's the gospel? Creation, fall, redemption, consummation. Now I got to move. I got to talk fast. Let's go to creation. Just for a minute. Because we've been jacked. We've been hacked. We've been pimped. We've been played for fools. And if you're of the Negro tribe, you should really be mad. The LGBTs have pimped you. The Marxists have pimped you. The baby killers have pimped you. Karl Marx was a man. You should be real mad. You and you a woman, and now you can't if you finally, finally you a woman. Y'all talking about Church of God and Christ don't give women a chance. You what? They, now they got men that took your place. And ain't no women saying nothing about, well, I don't want to offend. It is XY chromosomes. Okay, okay. Let's go through these four. Can we do that? Can we do that? Can we do that? All right. Thank you, Bishop. We're going to go. We're going to push. Creation. Creation. If we're going to be standard bearers, we got to hold to Genesis. In the beginning, God created. Period. Not period. Period. I'm too much a man to put a T at the end of my period. <laughs> I'm a man. <laughs> Ain't no way. I just want to make that clear. No ambiguity. In the beginning, God created. And we know that God created. I know you went to school and they told you a bunch of stuff that is not scientifically proven. I don't have time to say it, but, but all you need is a fifth grade science book to prove the Bible to be right. The, the, the laws of thermodynamics, y'all already know this, right? The laws of thermodynamics, okay, yeah, yeah, y'all already know it, so let me just repeat it. The laws of thermodynamics, anything that is in order had to be put in order. The, the order of the universe is chaos. The universe automatically goes to chaos. Anything that is in order had to have a designer to put it in order. That is the law of entropy. So if the universe is in order, it could not have just uh, uh, evolved into order. You can't get order without an order maker. That's scientific. Follow the stinking science. Look at this beautiful church. Look at how these pews are symmetrically designed. Do you mean to tell me that over billions of years, there was, there was grass that evolved to elephants. The wind blew and then the elephants became lily pads. The lily pads became seats, which became pews. And then they got in order over millions of years. They just got put here. If I told you that, you say I was crazy. And that's nothing compared to just the complexity of a human eye, which is billions of cells. Just the eye to be put together took some intelligence. So just looking at the laws of thermodynamics, look at it, look at it, look at it. I don't know. I'm in Raleigh. I'm in Raleigh. Next slide, next slide. Uh, do you know what that is? Do you know what that is? That is a sweet potato pie. Thank you, Jesus. That's a sweet, and you can, I, I, I looked up sweet potato pies. They had some, they had some that didn't taste good because if you look at it, you can look at a sweet potato pie and know if it's good or not. And I had to choose that picture there. And I, I, I surmised with deductive reasoning that it had to be good because some of the pie was missing. The mother picture didn't have nothing missing. Some of them looked like they had strings in it. But, uh, yeah, see, y'all know about that. But what's in the sweet potato pie? Sweet potato, vanilla extract or nutmeg, sugar, butter, uh, eggs. Now, just stay with me for a minute. Just stay with me for a minute. So, so we can say that the pie had to be created. And whoever created the sweet potato pie could not be the same material of what's inside the pie. 
Can we say that whoever made the pie is not made of sugar, butter, eggs, sweet potato, whatever? And we also can say, because I just want to break down a second law of thermodynamics. We can also say whoever created the pie had to be outside the pie to make the pie. You can't be in the pie to make a pie. You got to be outside the pie to make the pie. Now, if that makes sense for a sweet potato pie, how much more would it make sense for all the known universe that there had to be somebody that created that time, space, and matter had a finite beginning and it has an end and it had to be somebody outside of time, outside of space, outside of matter that created it all. And since he created it, he can do like my wife does. She can take a sweet potato pie from Thanksgiving and it can taste good on a 4th of July. Cause, Cause it's her pie, she put it in the freezer. Suspended animation stops the natural processes from decay and holds it and brings it out, thaws it out, put it back in the oven is as fresh as it was on the day before. If my wife can do that with a sweet potato pie, how much can more our God do miracles in your life? How much can he reach in time and do something even when it's too late? How much can he come into space and change some things? How much can he get into matter and change it? Because he's the creator of everything. Somebody ought to say yes. yes. Hallelujah. If I had time, I'd stay here, but that's a whole message in and of itself. Let them kids come to the altar. Let them come. Let them praise God. Not only that, the uh, uh, teleological argument is an argument of order that the universe is finely tuned for our existence. It's not, I know, I know you've been watching Marvel. Oh no, forget Marvel. Well, Spider-Man is Marvel. Yeah. And you got, you got Porky Parker and all these other, from other parallel universes. They know, there's no real such thing as parallel universe. They just grooming you to get played. They preparing you to start believing in parallel universes subconsciously because they knew through arts and entertainment you build your worldview so it'll be reasonable for these children to believe in parallel universes. There is no, none, no proven, not even an inkling of a parallel universe anywhere. No, I know I can say that without fear of contradiction. My son minors in physics. I know I'm just a country preacher. But there's no, no. parallel universes. But this one is finally, de- finally tuned for us. <sighs> Everybody take a breath. Let it out. Whether you got good breath or bad breath, that was God breath. <laughs> Did you know that in the air, there's all mixture of gases? But in our air, there's 21% oxygen. If there was 25%, stuff would catch on fire. If there was less oxygen, we, we'd be, we, we would be able to believe, breathe as much. That's why when people go in high altitudes, they pass out. But God perfectly put it at 21%. He can, you may not have no custom clothes, you may not have no custom shoes, you may not have a custom wig, but I'm here to tell you every time you breathe, there's some custom air that God put for you. This is why the word of God says, let everything that have breath. The only reason why I can breathe is because God is great. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. The earth spins on its axis one time is a day. Re- re- revolves around the sun 365 days. That's a year. Am I right? Did I say that right? All right. Did I say that right, mother? All right. Did I say that right, brother, with the plaid shirt? Because you smart. All right. So rotate around the year for earth. Perfectly designed. If it went faster, seasons would change. Life would be unstable. If it went slower, things would be jacked up, but God put it just right. Spinning and spinning just so that we can exist. And, we, and nobody flew off the earth today. Nobody. Oh. And you know why? Because of one more thing that's not on the slide. Gravity. I mentioned it earlier. If gravity was 0.00001 less, 
we would fizz away. Our cells wouldn't hold together. It looked like uh, Star Trek when they, you know, they go and teleport. And if it was, if it was 0. 0.0001 more, we'd be crushed to death. But it's finely tuned perfectly so we can exist here on earth. What is man that you are mindful of us? In the beginning, God created. And we ain't even going to talk about the miracle of you. I don't have time. I hear the Lord saying, tell you. <laughs> when your daddy met your mama. Millions of sperm cells it was in a race. And when, he, when those sperm cells was running through and going toward the fallopian tubes to have a deep date with destiny that could only happen two days out of the month. And they had to meet in the right place at the right time. And then the mother's body saw them as aliens and they started shooting them and killing them because they were aliens. Choo, 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 choo. All these sperms were dying and you were in a race. But when you got to the right place at the right time, the sperm met the egg at the right time in the fallopian tube. It was outside or in the, anywhere else. It wouldn't have. And when it met, everything you needed, all the information of what you are now was in that joining of the consummation of that sperm and that egg. And don't you ever say you're not a winner because you won in a million. You beat a million of them. They don't even exist. And had that one not come, you wouldn't even be here. And all of the language, you know you got apps on your phone. There's an app called you. It's DNA written all over you. How tall you are. What complexion you are. What size you going to be. Big bone. You know, some of us just big bone. No matter how much weight you lose, you're always going to be a 10. You will never be a 4. <laughs> All that is written on your cells. And when we leave here today, we're shedding cells. And if they really want to know, they could tell who was in this room. Because there's a signature on every one of the billions of cells on your body. God's signature made by God. In the beginning, God created. You made by God. No accident. They didn't plan for you, but you were planned. And they teach us, I can't stay on this, but I feel like I'm in the right place. They teach us evolution. And you know, they done canceled Aunt Jemima. How you gonna cancel Aunt Jemima? That's my auntie. I love Aunt Jemima. You're gonna cancel Aunt Jemima, but you don't cancel Charles Darwin? You cancel Aunt Jemima, but you didn't cancel Charles Darwin? There are teachers in here who save, who teach Darwinism. Because you have to. Amen. You got to keep your job. Amen. I got to do what Pharaoh say. And Darwin was the biggest racist of all time. It was because of Darwinism that slavery was upheld. Good white people were riding all over Europe saying, let them people go. Don't let them be slaves. And the experts came out and said, they're not really human. Good white people was doing that. And the, the problem with the white folks at the time, I got to go because I got some more stuff to tell you. The problem with the white folks at the time was that they didn't listen to the word. They listened to the experts. And the experts said, according to Charles Darwin, we were the link between monkey and man. We were the proof that evolution was true. Preach, preach up. You're right. Oh, yeah. You don't have to believe me. It's in the title of the book. His book, we, they shortened it because they know people dumb. Anyway, oh, Origin of the Species. Yes, I read Origin of the Species. That's not the title. That's the shortened title. The title is, On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. It was a book about race. It was a book to suppress race. It was the greatest white supremacy book of all time. And the Black Lives Matter, the NAACP, the Urban League, all our Negro leaders have ignored that. And you thought you was down. Thought you was Afrocentric. <laughs> and, and by the way, 
There are no fossil records to prove evolution anyway. And, and by the way, anybody my age or older, all right, n- nobody want to admit it? Man, y'all like, mm, not me. You old. When we were in school, there was a theory of a simple cell. Y'all remember? It was called an amoeba. It was like the blob. Do, do, do. It was just a simple cell, just a blob. It's because the science hadn't caught up with the reality. And Darwin said, if there's complexity, then my theory of evolution is gone because you can't get complexity out of chance. And now we have found that cells are not simple at all. As a matter of fact, a guy named Michael Bay, he wrote a whole book on something called irreducible complexity. I don't have time to tell you, but just put it like this. A mousetrap is irreducibly complex. You cannot have a mousetrap. What is a mousetrap? Uh, quit acting like you ain't never had no mice. It's a platform on wood. There's a spring, there's a trap, and then there's an arm that holds it with the platform where you put the food on. If you take any one of those things away, it's irreducibly complex. You no longer have a mousetrap. That's right. It's irreducibly complex. You can't take one of those things away and still have a mousetrap. So it couldn't evolve. It had to be created. And that's, that's, that's something. That was only five things. If you, if you look at the, just the human cell, it's so irreducibly complex that it had to be designed, that it moves. It didn't even have a motor that how it moves, how they interact with one another, how they fight, how they deal. And, oh, Lord, have mercy. I don't have time to go into that. And so evolution cannot be true. Creation. What was the second one? Fall. Thank you, somebody. Fall. The world was created perfect by God. I'm almost done. Just give me just give me enough time to finish. The world was created perfect by God. However, man sinned. And when sin entered the world, he said, in the day you sin, you shall surely die. It but due to the fall in Genesis 3, everything was ruined. First marriage, beautiful marriage, Jack. Young children, murderer. And enter in a fallen society where we now live in a fallen world. God's design was perfect, but because of man's sin, there was a fall. This is why we have disease and racism and misogyny. This is why we have sickness and, and, uh, and, and, and catastrophes. Why would God let there be a tornado? Because we're in a fallen society. Why would God let my granny die? Because now, because of sin, we all will die. Because men are wicked. Oh, let me, let me make that clear. Humans are wicked, evil, ugly. No good. And since they're no good, that, that we live in a fallen society where men are falling. There was society. It says in Romans chapter 8, verse 18, it says, For I reckon that the suffering of this present world time is not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. But then verse 19 says, For the earnest expectation of the creation is for the manifestation of the sons of God. Even the animals. The mosquitoes ain't even supposed to bite. Dogs ain't supposed to bark. Lions ain't sp- wolves are not supposed to be predators. How do I know that? Because in the millennial, they won't be. The ox, the ox and the and the ox and the, the lion will be eating straw together. That's what the Bible says. So even the animal kingdom, your dog is nasty. I don't care if you go get it, get his nails trimmed and put perfume on your dog. They're still sniffing up behind another dog and doing dog stuff. Even if you feed it vegan food. (laughs) I could put it like this better. Because we live in a fallen society, in order to understand the good news, you got to know the bad news. The bad news is that because we're fallen, that we are in prey for the wrath of God. That God will demolish any human that is not that is standing in sin. Any human, no matter what, how good your intent is. Without the blood of Jesus, it's in my friend, my friend gave me this. Uh, this is the gospel. The love of God saves us from the wrath of God for the glory of God. And when you understand that, you really value being saved. And you recognize that you ain't been saved all your life. Because the biblical worldview, you ain't been saved all your life. You was born wicked. You came to church all your life, but you wasn't saved. 
God loves us so much that he saved us not from the devil. He saved us not from our haters. He saved us not from the, 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 these folks that want to get us. He saves us from his wrath. Because we've sinned, we deserve the wrath. The pure wrath of God. And God says, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. Because you sinned, I got to make a way of escape. Genesis 3.15. That, that you shall bruise his head, he shall bruise your heel. I got to make a plan. So the whole Bible is about getting us back to the garden and to protect us from his wrath. When you're not saved, you're walking in a curse. You're cursed. The love of God saves us from the wrath of God for the glory of God. So, so when you saw the Passover coming out of Egypt, when they put the blood on the doorpost, God said, I'm going to send my angel and they're going to kill the firstborn. Amen. The devil didn't kill the firstborn. God did that. Uh -huh. That's jacking up somebody's theology now. Whoa. Ain't God just loving? Yeah, that need for just love is love. God is a God of love, but he's also, he loves us so much that he doesn't want us to experience his wrath. God's a God of wrath. Hell wasn't created for you, but if you choose, you're going to hell. And I don't care what nobody say. You're going to burn forever. Jesus said the worm does not die and the fire is never quenched. But thank God, creation, fall, redemption. Just give me a few more minutes. Just give me a few more minutes. Thank God for redemption. The only means of being free is through Jesus Christ. Hebrews, Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 to 3. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the uh, which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto, looking unto the government, Looking unto your employer, Jesus. looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher, the Alpha and the Omega of our faith. Who, watch this, watch this, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Jesus, his love was so much. The love of God saves us from the wrath of God. He endured the cross because he saw what was set before him, he saw me, he saw you. He endured the cross, he despised the shame and has sat down, I can't talk on that, on the throne, on the right hand of the throne of God. But look at this verse three. This is where too many people get discouraged. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners, Romans 5, 8, even when we were sinners, Christ died for us, from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. If you tire, you discourage because you're considering the wrong people and the wrong things. Your validation is coming from the wrong folks. I love my mama, but my validation can't come from my mama. I love my daddy. My validation can't come from my daddy. I love y'all. I love y'all, but my validation can't come from y'all. If you never say amen, I'm going to keep preaching. If you'll never invite me back, I'm going to keep preaching. If you'll never appreciate me, I'm going to keep preaching. Consider him, lest you get weary and discouraged when we keep our eyes on how Jesus endured. We too can endure. I don't think I got time to tell you this story. I'm going to skip it. I'm going to tell you quick. There was an African king, the African king, there's an African king, and in one of the cities, they had a, a chicken thief. Chickens is real business. That's a big deal. And I'm not talking about the chicken you hire a hitman to kill for you. I'm talking about the chicken walking around. You know, well, I'm in North Carolina. Y'all know. My people from Rock Hill, South Carolina. So we, yeah, yeah, we, we same people. We same people. We same tribe. Yeah. So that's on my mama's side. So, so they were stealing chickens. And he said, whoever steal chickens again, because we can't have thievery. We can't have thievery. Whoever steal chicken again, going to get 10 lashes on their back. We're going to punish you. And he thought that was a severe thing. But the, in a couple of days, somebody stole chickens again. And he was infuriated. 
How dare you steal chickens? And I say I'm going to lash you. Now, from now on, we're going to make it hard. Anybody steal a chicken again? You're going to get 50 lashes. A few days later, somebody steals chicken again. Now he deploys the soldiers to say, we got to stop this chicken thief. We got to see what's going on. And you know what? I'm so upset. I'm so mad. I'm going to put basically the death penalty on this chicken thief. Whoever steals chicken is going to get 100 lashes. It's basically going to kill him. Two days later, they caught the chicken thief. They dragged the chicken thief into the palace, and it was the king's mama. Now the king has a dilemma. It's his mama who was stealing chickens. If he lets her go, he's not just. But if he punish her, he's not merciful. What does he do? It, it, it would undermine his entire reign. And so he has her locked up. And then the day of her punishment comes, they bring her out. They tie her to the pole where she's going to get lashed. They pull her shirt off. Her back is exposed. And they look at him. They're nervous. And he tells the soldiers, beat her just as hard as you would anyone else. If you don't, I'm going to beat you. And just when they drew back to hit the mother of the first of the hundred lashes, he says, stop. And he takes off his crown. He takes off his royal robes. He takes off his stuff. And he comes and stands over his mother and puts his arms around her. And he says, now beat her. And he took every one of her hundred blows. And he fell dead there. And that's what our king did for us. You deserved all those lashes. You deserve to be killed. You deserve to die. You deserve punishment. You deserve it. But the, but, 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 but the love of God saves us from the wrath of God for the glory of God and so because you live is to the glory of God he took the lashes for you and now he endured the cross despised the shame and now because he was wounded we can now be free Romans 11 verse 33 says oh the depths and the riches both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God how unsearchable are his ways his judgments and his ways are past finding out Google can't figure him out chat GBT4 can't figure him out your neighbor came his ways are unsearchable Bishop can I get my last point I'm gonna skip this part oh by the way Acts 413 that go back to him Acts 413 when you've been with Jesus they saw that they were uneducated. They saw that they were untrained, but they knew that they had been with Jesus. With all that you got, do people know you've been with Jesus? Or are you still trying to impress them with the things they already got? Or can you impress them with that? Oh, maybe, 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 maybe you don't talk good enough. Maybe, maybe you don't have the stuff they think you should have. But in spite of all that, there's something about you because I can tell you've been with Jesus. Last one, we looked at the uh, creation. Then we saw the fall. Then we saw redemption. That's, can we do the last one? It's consummation. Because this is the one, this is the one that, this is the one that keeps me from getting burning out. I don't burn out. I run like a madman, but I don't burn out because I know the consummation is coming. The consummation speaks of the parousia. <clears throat> The parousia is the Greek word of the return of God. There are many returns of Jesus, by the way. There's the rapture, and then there's here coming. There's the millennial reign, and there's him setting it order. Then we're going to reign with him for a thousand years, and then we'll be with him. The parousia, and when Jesus, the parousia means the world was jacked up in the fall. Everything was messed up. There's sin, there's crime, there's all these other things. But Jesus is going to come back and put it all back in order. Who? that's my hope right now. There won't be no more hypocrites. There won't be no more crazy folks. There won't be no more mass shooters. There won't be no more crooked politicians. He gonna put it all back in order. Woo, this ain't gonna last forever. He even gonna put the devil out of business. Revelation chapter 10 verse 10 said the devil who deceived him was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast, the beast from the sea, the beast from the earth, that's the antichrist and the false prophet leading the ecumenical movement. Y'all know all that. Yeah, the beast from the sea, the beast from the earth. He's going to lock him in a, uh, in, a, in a lake of fire and the devil, ain't going to be no devil laughing at folks in hell. Ain't going to be no devil talking and picking pitchforks. The devil was tormented day and night forever and ever. The devil and the demons will be tormented in hell. They ain't going to be talking to you and what you're doing here. No, they're going to be screaming themselves. Then it jumped down to verse 14 and said, Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. There will be no more death. And this is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. 
But I want to elaborate on that. I already talked about that. I want to encourage the saints now. But there's two judgments. There's two judgments. You don't want to go to the right throne. The white throne judgment ain't for me. That's where people going to go get their punishment. You know, there's some songs. I'm going to the white throne. Oh, my Lord. I'm going to the white throne. Uh -uh, You don't want to go to the white throne. I'm working with you now. (laughs) I lost my computer somehow. Uh, AV person, but there's a, there's a white throne judgment, but in Revelation chapter 22, verse 12 through 15, I can't read it all, but Jesus says, and behold, I am coming quickly, and my, what? Wait, didn't, didn't, I show, didn't I show that to you in Isaiah 62? He said he come with his rewards. All throughout the Bible, it talks about rewards. The saints, the saints, you, you, you've you been thinking you've been overlooked, and why, why don't I get my just due, and why haven't nobody recognized this? No, no, no. Whatever we do, we give you a million dollars a day. It, kept, it doesn't compare with the rewards that he's bringing. Behold, I'm coming. Oh. Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you, say all manner of evil falsely against you, for great is your reward in heaven. Oh, consistently through the biblical text, Old and New Testament, I can give you at least 30 scriptures where the Bible reminds us that he's coming to reward us. We're saved by grace through faith, but we reward it by our works. When you got saved, it was not the finish line. It was the starting line. And God is going to say, what kingdom work did you do? And I believe there's going to be some bishops like me. I'm a bishop. I'm a certified real bishop. I'm going to walk up where the bishop seat. They're going to say, bishop, go and sit down there. Mama Suki, you don't know Mama Suki, but she's been fighting demons and praying and leading intercessory prayer. There was only about 20 people there. You don't know nothing about that. There's a brother here that took care, took in children in his home. There's a person here that made sure they took care because remember, Remember, Matthew 25 says, what, the, what you do to the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you've done to me also. There's some folks you don't know about. They got overlooked. They never had a day. Nobody ever recognized them. But I see them, and I was keeping tally, and I'm going to reward them. And it says in the, tar- in the parable of the Minas, he said, not only will you be rewarded, you will rule over cities. <laughs> Woo! Give me, give me five more minutes. Go to the next slide. Go to the next slide for me. Go to the next slide. I'm lost now. Go to the next slide. Next slide. And now, oh, and loon over cities? We don't talk about heaven enough. That's why y'all discouraged. You ain't got nothing to look for. It's like going to school and never getting a degree. It's like going to work and never getting a check. You need got to have some hope. Do you know, you know how awesome heaven is? Look at this, look at this, look at this, look at this. It's beyond your comprehension. It says, Revelation 21, 16, the city is laid out as a square. It's a cube. <laughs> I like these preachers. Yeah. <laughs> they read their Bible. It, it's a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. He says, why is it long? And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. Its length, breadth, and height are equal. Go to the next slide. Now, I just looked this up. This is some facts on the heavenly city measures approximately 1,500 feet by 50, excuse me, 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles. 105,000 miles long, 105,000 wide, 105,000 deep. This is heaven. The Bible describes heaven. You, you, watch this. Saved people won't be, never be crowded in the afterlife in heaven. They literally took the measurements. If, if they measured it from Canada to Mexico, the Atlantic Ocean to the Rockies, that would be heaven. 2.25 million square miles. That, uh, that London is only 621 square miles. Heaven is 2.25 million square miles. The ground level area of heaven would be 3,623 3, times the size of London. If the city had stories, the holy city, you know the Bible is called New Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, that city we go into. If heaven had stories, uh, and, 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 and each story was 13 feet high, that's some high ceilings, right? Right? If it was a building with 13 foot ceilings, uh, uh, they, they, they estimate that heaven would be 660,000 stories high. <sighs> I can't wait till I get to heaven. If the cube if the cube, which is heaven, 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles deep. If the cube, which is heaven, allowed 20 billion residents, each person having his or her own private area would have a 75-acre cube on their own. That's way more than 40 acres in a mule. I'm getting my 75-acre cube on my own. 
But if, if heaven was smaller, if there was way more people, we hope there's more people. If there were more people and the city was smaller, it would have enough room. It has enough room to accommodate 100,000 billion people with plenty of room left over for parks, streets, other things that you see in normal cities. In other words, God has made, when he said, I want to prepare a place for you, he's preparing a place. Somebody ought to say yes. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to serve with God. Some, oh, God have mercy. So I say to you even right now, next slide. I say this is my last slide right here. Woo, don't be deceived. God is not mocked. I'm talking to the standard bearers. Do not be deceived. God won't be made a fool of. The devil won't, ah, uh -uh, the devil won't win. Your all oh, is worth it. It's worth the fight. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man sows, that's how he also reap. If he sowed to the flesh, he'll reap of the flesh corruption. But if he sowed to the spirit, he'll reap eternal life. Therefore, do we say therefore? And let us not get weary. Let us well, that go back to that go back to Hebrews 12 now. That if we keep our eyes on Jesus, we won't get tired. Let us not get weary in well doing. For in due season, in the Kairos. Because the same God who created time can do things in his own time, in a supernatural time. And in due season, in the Kairos, we will reap if we faint not. I ain't through, but I'm done. Standard barriers. I pray even right now that God strengthen and encourage you. And that you fight to the end. If I die today, I'm going to die running forward. Death is not my enemy because God is on my side. The power of God is with us. We on a winning side. And if I never have what they have, it's nothing compared to what God got in store to me. And I'm asking to live on a 659,000 flow. With my wife. I know we ain't married in heaven, but I want my wife next to me. I want to get on the nerves for eternity. <laughs> There's some people I want to pray for. If you want to rededicate your life to Christ, if you want to be saved, you want to be filled, or God's just been speaking to you, come quick, come quick, come quick, come quick to the altar. God's been speaking to me. And listen, I don't know. I know your pastor. I know your pastor. Hey, listen, I don't care how saved you are, what position you hold. The beautiful thing about our structure is that you don't have to be a leader. You got a leader here. So now you don't have to be in charge of none. He in charge. He the pastor. Now even, I don't care if you're a pastor, superintendent. I don't care if you're a district missionary. I don't care if you're a supervisor thrice over. 32nd generation church of God in Christ. If God is speaking to you, I'm waiting on you. Come on, come quickly. Come quickly. It don't matter where, where you rank. don't matter where you are. God about to do something miraculous in our life. Real quick. Come quickly. Come quickly. Come quickly. Come on, brother. Come on, sister. I need God to do something. God is speaking to me. God is speaking to me. God, come on, come on, come on. Come on, children. Come on, men. Come Come on women come on all across this altar all across this altar God is saying even right now I'm here God is God has given us supernatural encouragement there's some supernatural things happening in the spiritual realm and Satan is being defeated God answered our questions God encouraged and poured into our hearts come on come on come on I don't want you to come if you don't want to come I'm calling them telling those what want more from God I thought there'd be some preachers down here yet but I, they still working on it and there's some preachers that need to be up here on this altar not up there praying you need to be on the altar you ain't the pastor right now he the pastor yeah come on come on come on come on come on Come on. And I speak even right now. I believe God has already raised up an army. What God is doing now is empowering his army. He's empowering his army. Them folks that used to get you, yeah, 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 yeah. Just get as close as you can. Get as close as you can. What if, what if, what if, sis, what if God supernaturally filled and refilled about a hundred of us with the Holy Ghost tonight. Would that be all right with y'all? That means you got to lose control and let God do what he wanted. What if God filled or refilled us with the Holy Ghost? Yes! Then you, because I believe in the Holy Ghost, everything we need is in him. And on the, where'd that preacher go? Where'd the preacher go to preach before me? That's what he just preached about. That's why I didn't have to touch the Holy Ghost. He did that. I just wanted to lead up to the Holy Ghost. That power of the Holy Ghost. What if he filled these five-year-olds with the Holy Ghost? 
10 year olds, 12 year olds, 82 year olds, 58 year olds, men and women. If you want to get right with God, because you know, people been lying. Demons been lying saying, you know, you can fake it till you make it. I ain't never seen the word fake in the Bible. Ain't no faking it, nothing. There ain't no faking in no Bible. Anybody told you you can fake it till you make it, they're deceived and being deceived. They're deceivers being deceived. Ain't no faking it. You can have it for real. Though you fall, you're not utterly cast down because you're upheld by the hand of the Lord. If you want to make it right with God, you can make it right with God with us right here. Hallelujah. Just tell him, here I am, God. Just talk to him now. Talk to him for yourself. I don't have to tell you what to say. Repent! Repent! Repent. What do it mean to repent? That's not a my bad. That's not a I'm sorry, Lord. That's not just a I'm sorry. That means I agree with your word and I'm turning from where I'm at. That's not just I'm sorry, my bad. No, I repent, God, for the things that's in my life. Sins of omission. Sins of commission. I repent. As a matter of fact, if you're on this altar, you probably need to repent for things maybe you don't even know. But repent. Father, wash me. Created me a clean heart. He said in Hebrews chapter 10, he said, if you repent, I, I, your sin and your lawless deeds, I will remember no more. The omniscient God who knows everything will forget everything you've ever done. I can't figure that out. I, don't, I just know he said it and I believe it. Oh, I, I, I feel guilt coming off of somebody right now. I feel shame coming off of somebody right now. Because you're repenting. I feel it coming off you right now. No more shame. No more guilt. Yeah, you've been messing up. But oh God, he said, behold, I make all things new. He's making it new right now. Let him make it new. Let him make it new. Let him make it new. Behold, I make all things new. Wash me, God. Wash me. Wash my mindset. Wash my attitude. Break me free from that addiction. Break me free from them things I do. Wash me. I want to look like you. Repent. Don't be, don't be too proud to repent. Don't be too big to repent. Don't be too saved where you can't repent. Shake it now, God. Wash me. There you go. There you go. The Holy Ghost in this place. The power of God. All kind of miracles about to break out in this place right now. All kind of miracles about to break out in this place. Because the Holy Ghost is here. Yes! Yes! Thank you, God. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you. You know what? If you repent it, you're justified. It's just as if you've never sinned. You wash clean. It's just as if it never happened. Now, now we all qualify to receive the Holy Ghost. Now we all qualify. Ain't nobody higher than the other. We all qualify to receive his power. We all qualify to receive the supernatural power of God. We walking in a supernatural now. God gonna touch, 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 touch. Now listen. Now what you gotta do? The Bible says, if a child asks his father for bread, he ain't gonna give him a rock. If he asks for meat, he ain't gonna give him a, a scorpion. So if you ask me for the Holy Ghost, I'm gonna give him to you, that's it. I'm gonna give him to you. I'm gonna come to you. I'm gonna take it even further, don't ask. Cause a good child don't ask their parent for something they already promised. When you got a good daddy, you don't say, daddy, can we go to the stove when daddy already promised to take you to the stove. You say, let's go to the stove like you promised. Am I right? You got children. They don't, they don't ask no more. They demand. You demand from God. Fill me with your Holy Ghost like you promised. I can't make it without your power. If you already feel, tonight is my night to be refilled with the Holy Ghost. Refill me with the Holy Ghost. Because in Acts 4, in Acts 4, Acts 5, they were filled again. Fill me! Demand it from God. Fill me! I need your power. Show me your glory. Yes! 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 Show me your glory. He already moved. 
for those of you, let me give you two more things we're going to do. You want to be filled. You done, you done repent it. You done demand it from God to fill you. I'm about to pray. Two things I'm going to give you directions. After I pray, if you want to be filled with the Holy Ghost, you got to open your mouth. Open your mouth and just praise God. I don't care what you say. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I love you. And you ain't seeking for tongues. You're seeking for God. You're seeking for a supernatural encounter. Something the witches can't do. Something the new age can't get you. Something crystals can't get for you. Something they can't do. This is a supernatural encounter with God. Father, I love you. Now listen. And as you praise God, the Bible says, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Whatever starts to bubble up, don't question it. Don't think about it. Don't wonder, is this God? Whatever comes up, let it flow out. And then let me and Bishop be the judge if that's God or not. Don't wonder, is that God or is that me? Whatever flow up, as you praising God, he gonna shift your language. He gonna change you. You're gonna lose, you're gonna lose sense of where you are, of time, space, and matter, because you're going to heavenly places. Just go there with God. Don't try to figure him out and let him toss you. Let him empower you. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask that you show us your glory. Show us your power. Show us your grace. Do it now, God. Now open your mouth and praise him. Open your mouth and praise him. Don't let go till he bless you. Don't let go till he feel you. Yet I bash your head, I bash your heart. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yet I bash your head. Yes. Yes, God. Father, we bless you. Father, we praise you. Open your mouth. Open your mouth. I bash your head, I bash your heart, I bash your heart. Open your mouth. Yes! Red up, I say, hey, touch me new today. Show me your glory. Yes! 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 Yes, Lord! Let go, let go, let go! Let go, let go, let go! Yes! Yes, God! Yes, let go! Yes, let go! Yes! Yes! Let go! Yes! Let go! Let go! Let go! Let go! Let go! Let go! Yes, God! And it is so! In the name of Jesus! Jesus! Feel me, Lord! Show me your power! Show me your glory! Feel me, Lord! Yes! 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 Yes, 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 God, yes, God, hallelujah, hallelujah. Yes, God, right now, I speak of it right now, supernatural strength, supernatural strength, cut the ties even right now, I rebuke the work of the enemy right now, supernatural strength, yes, hallelujah. Hallelujah! 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 Yet I bash your head, I bash your heart. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Yes! Yes! Yes, God! Yes, God! Yes, God! Yes! Yes! Let go! Let go! Let go! Let go! Let go! Let go! Let him touch you deeper than he ever touched you. Yes! Yes, God. Yes. Yes, God. Do it now, God. Show your glory. Show me your glory. Yes. 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 Glory, Lord. Hallelujah. Yes. Don't let go. Don't let go. I ain't letting go till you bless me. I'm not letting go till you bless me. I'm not letting go till you bless me. I ain't letting go till you bless me. Yes! Hallelujah! 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 Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, 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 come on
come on, come on. Don't worry about it. If I'm going to touch you, let him touch you. Let him touch you in the back. Let him touch you in the side. Touch me in this place, God. Show me your glory. Cry out. It's me, God. It's me, God. Here I am, Lord. It's me, Lord. Here I am. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Tell him yes. Let go. Let go of the shame. Let go of the pain. Let go of the memory. Let go. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's restoration in this room. God is restoring. God is restoring. Let him restore you. Do it even right now. Yeah. to come. 